Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship. And we welcome anyone who's watching us via the streaming this morning, and also those of you who will perhaps watch later on in the week for the recordings that we do. Now, I've got one or two notices. The first one is quite important before we really start into our act of worship, and that we have some birthdays. We have a, a certain lady on the 12th who shall remain anonymous, but it's Alice. And the other young gentleman whose birthday is on the 15th is David. So we wish you both a happy birthday. And can we, like we normally do, sing a happy birthday? Happy birthday to you. We have to applaud at, you know, reaching such great age that they are. <laughs> With great wisdom, of course. Now, on Ash Wednesday, which is this Wednesday, of course, you know, we start Lent then. We have a 1.30 lunchtime service here, so it's straight after coffee shop. 1.30 in here, and we will be ashing, so that's okay. We will also be streaming it, so you who are watching may want to join in with the start of Lent. Now during Lent, so from Wednesday, I'm going to be doing some postings on WhatsApp and also on Facebook. So every day there will be a posting that will go on and it is a um, little reflection some Bible passages to look at, and the question. But for those of you who are not on WhatsApp or Facebook, I've done little booklets for everybody. So if you want one of these little booklets, you can follow it each day. It starts Ash Wednesday. It includes Sundays. So you don't get out of, you know, normally if you give something up in Lent, you don't have to worry about it on a Sunday because Sundays don't count. Well, yes, they do in this little booklet. So if you want one of those, I've got some here. Just see me afterwards. But those of you who are on WhatsApp or Facebook, I'll post them every morning. And basically, there's just a little passage from Isaiah on Wednesday, several readings for you to look at, and a question for you to think about and reflect on. So you can collect those after worship. With, that's it for notices. Oh, yes, uh, there is a church meeting on Monday uh, in the hall, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, yeah. So anyone can come, but we remind that only church members may vote at anything that might come. A call to worship then is taken from Genesis chapter 46 and just, just a short verse. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt for I will make you into a great nation there I will go down to Egypt with you and I will surely bring you back again we start our act of worship we're using hymn books again today but for those of you who are watching by the streaming you will get the words that will appear 171, give to our God immortal praise.
so we gather together in our prayers. Let us pray. Holy and blessed three, as we meet together in our fellowship now this morning, we meet to bring you our thanks. Our thanks for all that we have and for all that you give to us. We bring you our praise too as we meet because we come remembering all that you've done for us and we, we want to really bring our gratitude this morning. As we meet in our praise and in our prayers, we praise you for our freedom to worship. And we gather together knowing and remembering that it was once denied us, as it is for so many people around the world. We thank you too for the ability to be able to challenge and to question the way things are. We come praying for our church meeting on Monday. Remembering how our forebearers suffered for that right to hold meetings and to offer praise to you, as many in the world still suffer today. And we marvel at our freedoms to love and to live. We remember those hard-won battles, knowing that many battles are still yet to come. Lord Jesus, by your power you brought healing and light. But so often, although we confess ourselves to be true servants, we prefer to walk in darkness and in despair. By standing on the edge of society, you showed us how to see how to help and care and love. And yet so often we prefer to close our eyes to suffering. On your redeeming wing, we find delight and freedom, but we still prefer the bondage of sin. As we meet together in our act of worship, we pray now that you would Heal us and forgive us, O oh Lord. Most Holy Spirit, life-giving spirit of truth and love, we pray that you would speed on your flight and that you would bathe us in your loving kindness, that we accept the forgiveness you offer and that we find the courage to forgive others and the grace to forgive ourselves. As we meet together, Lord, at the start of Lent, we pray that we may take the next 40 days to reflect, to think about, to question, to accept and we pray that through your Holy Spirit you will be with us in all these days until we come to that glorious day of your resurrection Heavenly Father bless us all who are gathered here bless all who are watching for each of these prayers we bring and we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so as we gather together, we bring that prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples, the prayer that we still use and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. <clears throat> but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. You should have picked up a hymn sheet when you came in, so you should have a hymn sheet as well now. Okay? So this is Work Man of God, or Lose Not Part. And so we stand to sing this hymn. You'll know the tune. <laughs> So now we'll take up our offering for the work of God in and through this church. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather here, we thank you for all that you have given to us through Jesus Christ. We bring you some tokens of money, gifts that we would ask you to bless for the work and witness that they will do through this church, through this church in this community through this church in the wider world. We ask too that you would bless those who have given these gifts, that they too may be blessed, blessed with sight that they can recognize the gifts that you have given to them. All we ask is that you bless each gift and bless each giver. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to have our children's reading by Liz and then Lorraine will bring our other readings. Thank you. We're back to the New Testament this week after a little slip to Elisha. This story is Calling Disciples. Jesus went from town to town telling people about the kingdom of God. They were impressed by what he taught and wanted to hear more. 
So by the time he came to Capernaum, a city that sat on the edge of Lake Galilee, the crowd was enormous. Jesus needed to find a way that he could both be seen and heard. And when he saw two fishing boats floating at the water's edge, he had an idea. The boats were empty and the fishermen were washing their nets after a night out on the lake. Could I borrow one of your boats, Jesus asked one of the fishermen, whose name was Simon. Sure, said Simon replied. When Jesus climbed into the boat, he asked the fisherman to row the boat just a little way out from the shore. And having put a little distance between himself and the crowd, and having made sure that everyone could now see and hear him, Jesus began to teach. When his talk was finished, Jesus spoke to Simon again. Let's go out into the deep part of the lake, Jesus said, and catch some fish. Simon was puzzled. Sir, he said, my friends and I were out on the lake all night and we didn't catch a thing. But hey, if that's what you want, we'll have another go. So off they sailed, Jesus and Simon and his fishermen friends. And when they had reached the deepest part of the lake, Jesus said, lower your nets. The fishermen did what Jesus said, down went the nets. And soon those nets were full of fish, fish flipping and flapping and flopping, nets so full that they looked like they would break. Simon called for help from a nearby boat and his friends, James and John, rowed over to him and pulled on the nets as well. And soon both boats were full of fish, fish flipping and flapping and flopping, so full in fact that they looked like they might sink. Simon looked at Jesus. This was no ordinary man and that huge and unexpected catch of fish proved it. Frightened, he fell to his knees as if he was falling before God and said to Jesus, go away please. I'm a man who's done lots of wrong things and I don't deserve to be in your presence. Jesus smiled at him and, and then he said, don't be afraid. I have a job for you and for your friends. I want you to become different kinds of fishermen, fishers of women and men. So when they returned to the shore, Simon and his brother Andrew and their friends James and John followed Jesus. They became his disciples, determined to go where he went, watch what he did, and learn as much as they could from him. And so they left everything else behind, their boats and their nets, and that great catch of fish flipping, flapping, and flopping. This reading is from Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. The Servant of the Lord. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. And he said to me, you are my servant. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. Moving on to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 to 13. The nature of true apostleship. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries of God as revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, 
Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun the reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. Here ends the lesson. Thanks be to God. So we thank Liz for her reading and we really in some ways need to hold on to what Liz brought because that ties in with what we're going to talk about. Just sort of moves along a little bit. So remember that first of all Liz was speaking about calling of disciples. Okay? So hold on to that because you're going to need it a little bit later on. And we thank Lorraine for her readings today and we simply pray that God will bless those readings that those who have heard may act and be blessed through those words. That takes us to the next hymn then. Brother, sister, let me serve you. One, two, six, one. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too.
So keeping in mind, <coughs> excuse me, what Lorraine mentioned, Liz mentioned, both L's this morning, you get muddled up with Lorraine and Liz, don't you really? I want to read a story to you. <coughs> you know how I like to bring little stories for you to think about, so we're going to start with a story. One day, a friar arrived at an abbey, looking very thin and looking totally dejected. And you could see that he was obviously very hungry. And one of the brothers went to him, asking him what had happened to him. Well, I was walking in the woods when I came upon a cat which was lying near the bushes. And I went over to look at it, but it didn't move when I got near to it. So I got nearer, but it still didn't move. And then when I looked at the cat lying there, I saw that it had no legs. Ah, oh, come on. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. Well, you know, there is interaction in worship. It's not all one way. Let's have another ah. Oh. Ah, oh, there we go. That's better. And so, I started wondering how it would get food. How it would be fed. And so I decided to hide and to watch. Well, after a while, I saw a fox approach with a half-eaten rabbit in its mouth, which it gave to the cat. I took this as a sign from God that if I became a hermit, the Lord would feed me. So I found a cave. And I sat, and sat, and sat. But no food came to me. And day, well, you go on then, another one, yeah, yeah, ah, oh, yes, all right, yes. Day after day, I waited. But no person, no animal, no bird. Nothing brought me anything. And I remembered the story of Elijah, how the ravens fed Elijah. But nothing fed me. And I got hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. And so eventually I thought that if I stay here any longer, I will die. So I left and came here, hoping that you would give me food, food for my body, and good counsel for my spirit. Well, said the brother, food is no problem. Just go to the kitchen and you will be given something to eat. You'll be given food. But as for counsel, I think it was a sign from the Lord. But you have arms and legs. It was the fox you were meant to copy. Okay. So for a short while, we're just going to think about the servanthood of believers. The servanthood of believers. Well, I suppose the first question is, what is a servant? And each of us, I suppose, have got different answers to that question. It may be what you've seen on programmes, such as when we used to watch upstairs and downstairs, you know, where the servants were downstairs and the rich people were upstairs and the servants had to come up and down and wait on hand and foot and blah, blah, blah. Or perhaps a, a later one was Downton Abbey. Same sort of thing, just brought perhaps 
a bit more modern. Perhaps that's what you see a servant to be. Or perhaps you might say a servant is one who serves his master or one who does as he's told. No good for me because I don't do as I'm told anyway but that's another tale. Or perhaps it's one who does something for somebody else. In today's business world, and for a number of years now, there's been an idea called servant leadership. And a servant leader achieves results for their organisations by giving priority attention to the needs of their colleagues and those they serve. Perhaps that happens in church. And servant leaders in the business world are often seen as humble stewards of their organisation's resources. But is that true servanthood, or would we call that manipulative servanthood? If we took the opinion that a servant is one who does something for someone else, then perhaps that example is true. But is that the servanthood in the way that Jesus showed? Servants, in a biblical sense, were called upon wherever they were, at whatever time of the day their services were needed, to work for the master. In Roman times, we know that servants, it wasn't necessarily a nice job. You might have a nice master, you might have an awful master that expected terrible things from you. Terrible things. A lot of servants, of course, we know were slaves who were forced into that position. In our Old Testament reading, God is speaking to Isaiah. And really he's talking about our Saviour Jesus. Thou art my servant, O Israel, whom I will be glorified. In that short bit there, God is making a declaration that Jesus was his servant. And if we look closely at the passage, you'll see the true definition of a servant. God said that Jesus was his servant in whom he would be glorified. The glory to God was going to come through Jesus. The glory to God was coming through Jesus. And Jesus allowed God to accomplish something through him. And that really is the true definition of a servant. A servant is one that allows something be accomplished, accomplished through that person. A servant does not do something for someone else. If you look at John's Gospel, chapter 17 and verse 1, it says, glorify your son so that your son may be glorified may glorify you. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. Jesus speaking to his father. And yes, we can all agree that doing something for someone else is thoughtful, is nice and is kind. But it's not necessarily servanthood. Because the only focus is in that, in that situation is on the doer. And we'd call that pastoral work. When we are true servants, we have no focus on ourselves. The only agenda a servant has in mind is the one person being served. <clears throat> and when we look at all the wonderful and miraculous works that Jesus did, we can see that Jesus had no other agenda, no other agenda other than to glorify God. Jesus made a statement in which he said, if anyone sees me, then they see the Father. When Jesus helps us, 
when Jesus becomes our servant, he has no hidden agenda. He wants to love and he wants to help because that's who he is. That's who God is. He wants us to love him, to work to as servants for him. Well, there's no expectation of reward. No expectation of reward by him for doing all those things for us. The fox, when it fed the cat, at the beginning was to offer the help that this animal needed. It needed to be fed, so it fed it. And the reward for doing this was to have served. The only question that a servant needs to ask is, what do you want to accomplish through me? For Christians, we're to address our question to our Heavenly Father. What do you want to accomplish through me? A servant doesn't seek reward or remuneration. And the joy a servant get comes from the fact that the one being served is able to accomplish something. Jesus told us that he did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister. And a true servant is someone who can be ministered through. I suppose the question is for us, are we Jesus' true servants? One whom he can minister through? I don't know. You have to ask that question and answer that question yourself. Each one of us called to this place has been called to be part of a servant church, not a servant building. Servant building doesn't work servant church does because we are the church the gathered people we should all have a love like Christ for everyone he didn't pick and choose everyone was the same to him even those who hated him and despised him and ill treated him he still had love for everyone Jesus proved and still proves that he was, he is, and will always be a servant to everyone. Bring it together. And as I was trying to tie these thoughts up, I thought of the prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola and that is what we're going to finish on and I'm going to read it to you teach us good Lord to serve you as you deserve to give and not to count the cost to fight and not to heed the wounds to toil and not to seek for rest to labor and not to ask for any reward save that of knowing that we do your will. Amen. We turn to our hymn books again now as we turn to the hymn 784, Ye Servants of God. 784. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name.
And so we come together in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord Most High, so often we forget your goodness to us and we turn our minds away from the marvels you have done. You called us in our mother's womb and you consecrated each one of us gathered here to your service. You poured love and grace upon us you move mountains for us and keep us as the apple of your eye. And we thank you for all your loving kindness seen throughout our lives, especially in those difficult times that we have to face. Your love held us even then, even without sometimes as ever realizing that you were supporting us. And so as we gather here, we pray that you would bless with your love all those who find life unbearable today. We pray for those living in fear of war and dictator and those who are crowded in unsafe refugee camps. We pray for those working for peace yet being shouted down by the warmongers. We pray for those waiting for life to end. And we pray you would help us to be committed to work for a better world. Risen Lord Jesus, we praise you for your life of loving service. Defiant proclamation and truth-telling to power. Remind each one of us of our call to resist the powers of evil that stalk our world. And our responsibility to tell the truth whatever the cost. And remind us too of the price of love involved in carrying our own crosses. And so we pray now as we gather that you would bless with your love all those who are called to tell the truth this day. Those who you look down upon. Those who you have called to servanthood. We pray most Holy Spirit and we praise you for the energy that you give to the church. So often and more often surprising us and calling us to new forms of life and vitality. Even sometimes when we least expect it. Even through disagreements new life can emerge. New ways forward. So bless each one. And make us always eager to proclaim the gospel through word and through deed and through acts of love. We pray and we remember all those who donate to and volunteer in food banks. Those who seek to make women's refuges safe and healing places. And those who welcome people into groups for addiction, where step by step, freedom is found. Eternal trinity of love in our thanks and our prayers. And in a moment of quietness and stillness, we bring to you those that we love and those that we worry about.
and each of these prayers, those that we speak and those that come from our hearts and minds, those secret prayers sometimes, Lord, we bring in that precious, precious name of Jesus. Amen. A closing hymn for this morning then is the hymn 459, Master Speak, Thy Servant Heareth. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us this day and even forevermore. Amen.